I'm with Dr. Thomas Bates here in Cornwall, Ontario. Doctor, you're, you're quite a rarity here and you've had a, a story career. You've worked with the Mayo Clinic. Um, you are someone that came to Canada in the 50s with the Hungarian Revolution. Yes. We were talking about a quote where you had said you, you had seen fascism with the Nazis and communism with, with the Soviets and then you came to Canada and you went from Budapest, which is a highly cultural city, to Edmonton of all places to finish your medical degree. That's correct. What was the culture shock like coming from, from Budapest to Edmonton? Well, it's not so much a culture shock. It, it was more really a sense of isolation. Mm -hmm. And I'm very much aware of the uh, first generation immigrant problems. And they tend to uh, locate where they had countrymen of their own. Mm -hmm. well, I was alone in Edmonton. I never really wanted to be part of the Hungarian community in Canada because I wanted to become a Canadian. Mm -hmm. And uh, going to university and so on, I didn't know the customs, I didn't know how to date a girl, I didn't know how to order something. I was talking about the justice of peace, in, uh, but I, saw, I said the peace of justice, and I was talking about the movie, the snake previews, mm -hmm. instead of sneak preview. I, I just didn't know the culture, so and it was you, very lonesome for many years. And you discovered hockey. Yeah, um, they took me out to play hockey, but after five minutes they had to stitch me up, so <laughs> therefore they never invited me to play again. So how do you end up from Edmonton to Cornwall? I went to the Mayo Clinic for my residency training, then I went to Hamilton, because Hamilton started a university in the late 60s, a medical school, McMaster, so I was very much part of the nephrology, the kidney. Mm -hmm. problems, the kidney uh, side of McMaster, uh, but then the university did not put me on the faculty. Mm -hmm. um, my, my resident took my place and uh, I found Cornwall needed an internist, so that's why I came here. And that was what year? 75. So you have been here 40 years 40 now, years. practicing in Cornwall. That's correct. You have outlived most of your patients. Well, I'm not so sure, but probably. <laughs> so what do you attribute your longevity to? Genetics. Genetics? Good genes. <laughs> and, and the daily grind. We're sitting in your office here. It's, 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 a, it's a little space, and all it is is files. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> how many patients do you think you've served over, over your career? I wouldn't be able to add it up. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to add it up. I have about uh, eight, nine thousand active files. But that's active as of today in 2015. Correct. Since 1975, if you've always had that many, I mean, you're you're, you're probably over, you've probably taken care of over a hundred thousand patients in your career. Well, I wouldn't say a hundred thousand, but I I would have no idea. All right. I would have no idea. And. Do you think you're ever going to retire? No. No? No. <laughs> no reason to? No reason. So, we live in an era now where someone has a heart blockage, they can put in a stent. We have drugs now that do things that they could never do before. For you as a doctor, what have you seen as some of the biggest changes in medicine since you started practicing here in Cornwall in 1975? Both the physical technology and the drug industry. Mm -hmm. I mean both. I keep telling our patients that today we are older than we were 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. We probably have a worse lifestyle. We don't walk as much and so on. We have more fast foods, everything. We probably are not as physically active as our uh, parents were, grandparents were 40 years ago, yet the average life expectancy increased by some nine years, despite more pollution and more stress and everything. And that basically better technology, both for the heart and kidney dialysis, better surgery and uh, basically better drugs. People are afraid of what drugs we use 
But I mean, they are proven to prolong life. They are proven to prevent problems. Our goal in medicine now is not only to treat, that is what we did 50 years ago, but our major shift in emphasis is to prevent. Now, Canada with Medicare has some challenges, or here in Ontario, OHIP. I was reading some of the things that you, you've written about, and you were chief of medicine for, for the hospital here as well for a while. And I think you're still on the advisory board? Well, uh, as chief of staff and the chief of uh, and president of the medical staff and so on, you are on the board automatically. Yeah. And, and Lauren Scharf, who's the chief of staff at the hospital currently, currently. said that he considered you a mentor, which is a, a huge compliment. Well, we both uh, do things for the best of the community. Now, you talk in some of the writings and interviews that I've seen of you about the economies of healthcare now and how it, it's a three-pronged thing where you have the consumer, which is the, the government essentially, and then you have the patient and their responsibility. Yes. The challenges that the health system's facing from, like, for instance, you talk about in one section about people missing appointments and the yes. impact that that can have. How do you see healthcare evolving in Ontario and Canada? I, I think both the public and we in the professions have become, have to become more professional in the sense of e evaluating what we do, is it cost effective? Mm -hmm. Our problem is lack of money naturally, I mean we know in society we don't have enough money for many many needs, mm -hmm. but the problem really is I I think we can use our money better. We have to become more efficient, both the public and the professions. You know, reduce duplication, reduce unnecessary things. Public sometimes demand things that we don't agree that it needed, yet we have to uh, do it because it requested and uh, almost demanded. We sometimes overshoot because we are afraid to miss the problem. So when there is a 1% chance of something, we still expend a lot of money on uh, looking to be sure. Uh, I'm not talking about inferior care, so I'm not trying to substitute inferior care because it's cheaper, but I think <clears throat> health economy has to take priority from today on. Not just good health care, but economic health care. Now, you've worked with a lot of doctors over the years. In your opinion, what is the best and finest quality in a good doctor? It's very difficult to amalgamate listening to the patient, but how do you deal with it when there are preconceived ideas that you cannot dislodge? That's where the challenge comes in. Most of the patients are here to listen to me, and I hope I give the right answers. Not always. We are all humans. We cannot know everything. We cannot know the future. And I can only see what is happening today. I do not know what will happen a year from now. But we have to work together, and that is to me the necessary quality. Work together. And if I don't know something, I should say I don't know. That is the most important quality for a physician, to say I don't know. Humility. I will, no, not so much humility, but acknowledging our own knowledge. Mm -hmm. I cannot know everything. I admire the family doctors in today's world because they have to know so much about so many things. But I cannot know everything, even in my field. My judgment, whether I should ask another opinion or not, but uh, communicate well. That's one of the problems that medical schools don't teach. Communication, in addition to economic considerations. <laughs> For sure. All right, thank you, Dr. Bates. I know you're really busy this morning, and hopefully we'll interview you again soon. No, no, thank you very much for your kindness. <laughs>